Welcome to the first class in Scholastic Aramaic, uh, also known as Syriac in uh, scholarly terminology. Uh, this is a dialect of Aramaic that was used, I'm calling it scholastic because it was used in the schools. It's the Aramaic of the schools. Uh, because the schools that we're talking about of Edessa and Nisibis, um, especially, but also in some others as things extended, uh, because those schools were located in Syria, uh, the Roman province of Syria, and even till now, you know, at least partially in the country of Syria, because they were located in that region, the, this dialect of Aramaic came to be called Syriac, um, sort of for short. Um, it is uh, maybe the best way to understand what this dialect is, what this language is, that was written in the schools of Edessa and Nisibis by great authors like Ephraim and um, several Jacobs and some Isaacs and Narse and many, you know, basically all of the fathers of the uh, Church of the East. Um, maybe the best way to understand it is that it's kind of a common dialect, a kind of koine uh, Aramaic that the schools used that was a kind of mingling or combination of the dialects that were around it so that the, the actual regional dialects, um, when they read it, would at least be able to understand it. So it was kind of took what was most common in the grammar of all of them and kind of used that in the schools. Um, it came to be also, maybe most importantly for many of the, you that are watching these videos, the dialect of Aramaic that's used in the liturgy. So when we, you know, in the Chaldean church and, you know, the other the sister churches go in and sing, La Khumarad Kulla Maudenan, that's not like Chaldean or Assyrian or, or any like spoken dialect. That's this language that we're learning right now, this dialect. These are sister languages when we speak Chaldean or when we speak the, the, the Assyrian dialects or the Chaldean of any of the villages or whatever you want to say. Um, and we're talking about scholastic Aramaic. These are sister languages. They're branched from the same family of languages called Aramaic. In fact, the language that Jesus spoke is, a, is another dialect of it called Palestinian Aramaic. And those that know that dialect better than me better than I do, and also know Syriac, say, I think Sebastian Brock famously said, they were mutually comprehensible. So somebody who knew this, this dialect that we're learning, you know, starting now, and Jesus's dialect of Aramaic, they would have been unable to understand each other. They would have been sort of almost maybe accents of the same language, but at least with, with definitely within the same language family. The spoken Aramaic that maybe many of you and I speak, that grew, grew up speaking, that we call surah kind of colloquially is what's part of what's called neo-aramaic which it is again part of the same aramaic language branch but there's a segment of that there's a branch of that family of languages called neo-aramaic and then the various dialects of the villages and, and so on between iran and uh, iraq and so on those are kind of the sub dialects of neo-aramaic that's how these are related i actually think it's important to understand that Syriac or Scholastic Aramaic or in sort of common speech, you know, in, in Surath, we sometimes call it Gushma. I'll tell you maybe why that's why it's called that in a bit. It's really important, I think, to, to not think of Gushma or Syriac or Scholastic Aramaic as the source of our spoken Chaldean or Assyrian. It is not the source. They are different dialects. Certainly, Gushma is written before, many, many centuries before. It was written on paper before the spoken dialects that, that we speak, but that's because it was, you know, used in the schools and in the liturgy, and therefore it needed to be written down. It, that's not to say just because it was written down before, it doesn't mean it was any earlier. We don't know. We really don't know what the people on the ground in, I don't know, uh, around Mosul were speaking on in their day-to-day -day life. We really don't have records of that. Um, it may have been close to this, it may have been closer to what we speak, we really have no idea. Another important point of this is that our spoken dialects of Neo-Aramaic have some vocabulary, a, a pretty significant amount of, maybe not a huge percent, but many, many words that don't have an Aramaic origin at all that come from Akkadian, which is a different Semitic language entirely. And so Akkadian, which is what was speaking, spoken by 
the very ancient Babylonians and the ancient Assyrians, that was a different language than Aramaic. Aramaic wasn't around, you know, wasn't uh, uh, written at least 2000 BC, but Akkadian was. And many of our spoken uh, vocabulary in, in Surat and in Chaldean or in Assyrian actually comes from Akkadian and, and it's not even present at all in Aramaic. Uh, and so that really, I, I really want to kind of impress that. Though this is a very, very important dialect that we're going to start learning today, especially to understand the liturgy and the, the fathers of our church and our great writers, it's very important. Um, it, it, it's, it's really incorrect to think of it as the source of our spoken language. There are really two different things. Many things are related and many things, maybe there is a source in some aspects of it, but don't think it just because it was written down before, it's therefore older in every way. And because it's older, it's the source of everything that came afterwards. That's like three different fallacies in a row. It's not really right to think about it that way. Um, the way I'm going to go about this class, I thought I thought about this quite a bit. And I think the best way to go about this is this. My goal for you, the student, and this might not be your goal, so you maybe you can find another course if this is what you want, but what I would want to pass on to you is a working passive knowledge of Syriac. I want you, in other words, I want you to be able to read and basically understand what you're reading. Now, and, and if you would like one day to write in Syriac, that's awesome. I, I've done it before. It's, it's really fun to try to do that. It's the equivalent of, of trying to write something in Latin. It's a fun exercise. It's not the most useful thing in the world. I would suggest, even if that's your goal to one day want to write in that, you really need to begin with a passive reading knowledge. And then the more you read, the more you'll absorb your, the language, and then eventually you'll be able to write in it. But when I'm presenting the grammar to you, I want you to be, I want you to memorize it with a view to recognition. I want you to be able to recognize the forms and figure out what, what the root of the word is so that you can look up the root so that you can understand what you're reading. It's much more important. And I think this is natural. When we're little kids, we're not composing literature. We're listening to the adult speak and we're absorbing it. And, and then as we grow older, we start to speak it. Think of yourself in, in that in that way. Learn with it, begin with the passive knowledge. And that's what we're going to start with. Then, you know, as things go on, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to go to the greater things. Probably for most of you, just the ability to read and understand, probably for the first time, uh, the prayers that you're praying in the church that are in what we call the old language or Gushma or Syriac or Scholastic Aramaic has all these different names. Um, it might be the first time you actually understand them. I'm going to give you some, some advice on this. I really, really implore you, don't guess what words mean. Look them up. There are many instances. And even if you grew up in the middle of the most like Chaldean or the most Assyrian village in the world, and you never heard a word of any other language, and this is like it's deep in your bones to, to speak in that language. There are many vocabulary words that are exactly the same letters, but mean something different in Gushma in Syria. So don't just assume that because it's this word, it means the same thing. It, it's worth your time. Look it up. And you're going to learn the language much better that, that way than guessing. Um, and it's going to be tempting because it's like annoying to look words up. It takes time, but it's it's really worth it. Please, please. I, I You know, if you want to really learn it, that's the way to do it. Um, the way I'm going to go about teaching this class with that goal in mind is I'm going to begin with the last couple chapters of my, you know, book, my Bishop Snyder's book, Chaldean Grammar. The last two chapters of this, chapters 18 and 19, very rapidly go through the basic grammar of, of Syriac. I'm going to go through that. I don't know how fast. I'm probably going to go, go through it really fast. You are going to feel probably very overwhelmed at first. It's going to feel very alienating. And that's kind of okay. I kind of like want you to feel that way. Um, because you're learning a new language, it's kind of it's important to feel a shock at that because it's something new to you. Um, but I'm going to go through this, you know, the, these chapters in this book. I don't know. I, we'll see how, how long it takes me. Maybe anywhere between four and six recorded lessons. We'll see how, how that works. 
Then when we are done with this grammar, we're going to just go through and I'm just going to explain it to you. Boom, boom, boom. Rec- uh, uh, memorize this, memorize this, memorize this, memorize that. I'm just going to tell you to do that. You take your time. Obviously, it's an online course, however long it takes you to do that. Then when we are done with this book, we are going to start over. And I'm doing this on purpose. There's a kind of mental trick that that has worked at least for me, and I and I think it probably will work for you. And the saying is, if you want to learn something, you have to forget it seven times. And so I'm going to go through the entire grammar. You're going to hear me say these over and over and over again, these patterns that I want you to learn. Then after we're done with everything, we're starting over and I'm going to go through a different grammar. And that grammar is this one called Robinson's Paradigms and Exercises in Syriac Grammar. And it's going to be all the same content, exactly the same content, and we are going to repeat it. And the there are two benefits to this. One is repetition. Two, Robinson is pretty well organized as a grammar, probably better than, than many of the others. And he actually has pretty good vocabulary to learn and really good exercises. And so here's an example of the exercises that we can work through. Now, this will be, I think, a, a, a pretty, it'll be a confidence booster for you because a lot of what we're going to go through in Robinson, you're already going to have going to, you will already have learned from my book. And so it'll be a reabsorption of the material. It'll be familiar to you. And by the time we get to the exercises, after the second repetition, it's going to be, oh yeah, nice. Okay. Okay. And I think it'll, I think it's going to be a good kind of pedagogical way for you to, to learn what's going on. The reason why I didn't just start with Robinson, and I'm maybe you might feel I'm wasting your time going through my book first, is because Robinson is written in the Western script, as you probably saw when I held the book up. And the West Western script is its own thing, you know. Is and and before I start Robinson, I'm going to go through. I'm just going to kind of compare the letters so you can recognize them. It's going to be on you if you want to go and practice writing or something like that. But I want you to at least be able to read them. It's a slightly different set of letters. And it's a slightly different set of, well, it's a very different set of vowels. Just be able to recognize them, learn them. And then as you, we work through it, um, I think your reading will get better. It's actually important to learn the Western alphabet at some point because all the important dictionaries, here's the one that I usually rely on, all the important dictionaries are in the Western script. So if you want to be able to look up a word, you need to learn this alphabet. There's no there's no way out of it. Um, this is a uh, compendia syriac dictionary based on the, I'm reading this backwards, Thesaurus Syriacus of R. Payne Smith, edited by his daughter, J. Payne Smith. So uh, this is the one I like. There's, there's a handful of them. A lot of them are accessible online and there are search engines and stuff, but you, you need to know the script, uh, the Western script in order to read the entries and you need to know uh, the grammar in order to know what you're looking up. Uh, so that's kind of one of the interesting things about Semitic languages in general. All Semitic languages, you can't really just look at a word and then go look it up. You're not going to find it in the dictionary, most likely. You have to know the root of the word in order to know what to look up in the dictionary. And in order to know what the root of a word is, you have to know basically the entire grammar. So it's an interesting thing about, about most Semitic languages, including Hebrew as, as well that you sort of have to know the grammar first before you can ever touch a dictionary. So that's the way we're going to work through this. Then when we're done with a big portion of Robinson, I don't think I'm going to go through all of this grammar. I'll probably leave the weak verbs and stuff for you to to learn on your own. Um, But uh, once we're done with Robinson, I think what I'll do is I'll go through a couple pieces of literature with you, maybe something from the Gospels and maybe something from, let's say, Narsay. Who's, a, who's pretty readable once you learn know the grammar. And uh, we'll just sort of do a couple of, of, of lessons where I just have the text on the screen and I just read through it with you and I just kind of parse what each word is just to kind of exercise what, we, what we've learned. So um, good luck. And I hope this is beneficial to you. Um, okay, that's the introduction. Let's just jump right in. So what I want to do right now is share my screen. And we are going to go to chapter 19 of Chaldean Grammar. 
And I suppose my face is in a little window in the corner, and that's good. Okay. Chapter 19. So if you went through the grammar book before, we stopped right before this at the end of chapter 18. So here is chapter 19, scholastic, nouns, adjectives, and pronouns. We'll see how far we get today. Scholastic nouns with prepositions. In scholastic Aramaic, and as, as I said, it's also called Syriac and uh, Gushma and all kinds of other... Oh, sorry, it's called Gushma. I, I told you I'd come back to that. It's called Gushma probably because it was written and it was written on like animal skins. So when we say Gushma, it means the language that's written on, on skin as opposed to the language that we, we speak. I, I'm guessing that's because the word Gushma means skin or like flesh. So anyway... In Scholastic Aramaic, when the first letter of the modified word is the same as the preposition or closely related in pronunciation, it is softened. Okay, this is a little bit of a controversial thing, but I'm just going to say it. Um, you have a noun, and here's the noun. The noun, here's a proper noun, Babel, which means Babylon, the city of Babylon. Okay, if you want to say in Babylon, you already, if you went through the Chaldean grammar, you already know that if you want to say in you take the letter bith and you put it before the noun. It, the same thing goes for Syriac. You take bith, if you want to say in Babylon, you take a bith and you put it in front of Babel. However, that's hard to say. That's almost impossible to say. B -b Babel, B Babel. It's like you feel like your eyeballs are going to pop out of your head or something like that. So the way that the language fixed that pronunciation issue is, well, these letters, a lot of these letters can be softened. And you know that when you put a dot under a bith, it becomes a w sound. So when you say bababel, you don't have to say bababel. You can say buabel, buabel. So you take the bith and put it on babel. And that means the first letter that it's on, when that letter can be softened, and it's the same letter, you can soften it to make it pronounceable. Bababel becomes buabel, buabel. It makes it pronounceable. It kind of gets a little bit away from the original pronunciation of the word, but it's okay. It's not the end of the world. If you want to say of David, David is Dawid. Of is D. D, -d Dawid is hard to pronounce. So you say D Dawid. D Dawid. So you soften that second Dalath into a Dalath. D Dawid. Tawditha means confession. Or uh, repentant. It can mean a lot of different things. Toditha can actually mean religion as well. Um, but Toditha, if you want to say of the faith or of the religion or of the confession or something like that, when you're confessing that God is good or something like that, if you want to say something of that, well, Daleth and Tau are really close in pronunciation. So you can say Toditha. This is softened, the dot kind of disappeared in the printing. Toditha. Now, that's a pretty kind of reasonable rule. Here's where there's some controversy, and I'm going to give you my opinion. This is also Bishop Sethead's opinion. This is also the opinion of a, a, a handful of other very, very intelligent Syriac scholars. You can reject this if you want, and when you pronounce it, let's say you're praying in church, just do whatever your bishop tells you to. Don't, like, take a stand and whatever, like, make a... Uh, embarrass yourself. But, just for you to understand, at some point, that rule became distorted and maybe exaggerated. And this sort of rule, this distorted rule, says that all these letters that can be softened, begad kafat, so beth, gamal, daleth, kap, pe, and tau, all these letters that can be softened must be softened when any of the prepositions precede them. So the rule went from, if it's the same one, well, you want to soften it so you can pronounce it, to, well, any of them that can be softened, you want to soften them. But the rule originally was meant to make pronunciation easier, not mutilate the word. And this new rule results in pronunciation that's both awkward and difficult to understand. For example, the very clear word, if, again, if you know any Chaldean or Assyrian dialect, if you want to say, and at all times, and at all times. So, and, wa, at, or in, b, kul is all, and, at all. Zwan is zona. You already know the vocabulary word zona. Zwan is short, a shortened version of zona. So, and at all times. And at every time. 
Wub kol zuan. You you understand it. Wub kol zuan. But if you apply this rule, you got to soften all this. So that very clear word wub kol zuan becomes this incomprehensible mess. Wo kol zuan. And maybe you sound smart because apparently if you speak in a way that nobody understands, it makes you feel smart. But sound, feeling smart isn't the same as being smart. You're just speaking in a way that nobody understands. Oh, I know the rule. Okay, cool. You know the rule. Good for you. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The rules are there to serve us. We are not there to serve the word. And if the rule results in something that's incomprehensible to everybody you're speaking to, it's a bad rule. And you're not there to serve the rule. The rules are there to serve you. I don't think it's a good idea. But don't lose your life over this. Just obey obey your bishop. So, okay. Anyway, that's that. That's that rule. So now you understand it. Let's talk about possessive pronouns. The, in this classic dialect, there are two sets of attached possessive pronouns. Again, I'm assuming, and I'm hoping you've already gone through Chaldean grammar with me. This is a pretty familiar thing. You know, if you want to say my house, you say Bethi. Bethi. And you know that the E at the end, the Hwasa at the end, makes it my possessive pronoun. In Gushma, you have actually two sets of these. This is set A, which is actually fairly similar to the Chaldean set. And then this is set B. So let's go through these. There's a, there's a lot of similarity. So I'm going to use the word king, but the endings are what you really want to look at. If you want to say Melk, Melki, sorry, my king in, in Gushma, you say Melki. Or here's another rule that you can sort of debate the usefulness of. In Gushma, most of the time when you see it written, the Yod becomes silent. So if you say Melka, and if you want to say my king, it actually just becomes Melk. Melk. There's going to be a Yod there in the writing but you're not going to pronounce it. I don't think it's a very smart grammatical rule, but it's actually pretty universal. And in poetry, it actually becomes really important to not pronounce it because if you were to say the yod at the end, you're going to mess up all the syllables and it's not going to sound like poetry anymore. So in Gushma, you're going to very often see this spelled as melk, and there's not going to be a dot under the yod, but it really just means melki, okay, my king. Your king, masculine, is Melkach. Now, this should be very annoying to many of you because Melkach is how you say your king when you're speaking to a female. For some reason, and if anything, this might be evidence that Surah didn't come from Gushma, that, you know, Chaldean and Assyrian didn't come from Syriac. Melkach, Melkach means your king when you're speaking to a woman in Chaldean. Melkach in Gushma means your king when you're speaking to a male. So when we say, shmach, shmach, shma is name, shmach is your name, but shmach is your name feminine, shmach in Gushma is your name masculine. It's just the way the language is. It's a little bit awkward to get used to, but just get used to it. If you want to speak to a female and say your king, it's melkech. It has a silent yoth at the end, melke, So, but the real distinguishing thing is this e eh sound, melkech. If you want to really remind yourself that there's, there's a yoth at the end, melkechi, you can say that. So melk or melki, melkach, melkech or melkechi. Then it's a, just like the, the vernacular, melke, melka. His king, her king. Melkan, exactly like spoken dialects, our king. Melkhon, similar. We would say Melkhon, but Melkhon, pretty close, your plural king. Melkhen, this is new. Melkhen, there's an invisible vowel here that was lost in the printing. Melkhon, Melkhen. Your king masculine when you're speaking to a group of males. Melkhen when you're speaking to a group of females, your king. Melkhon, Melkhen. So this is what I want you to memorize is these endings. Melki, Melkach, Melkech, Melkeh, Melka, Melkan, Melkhon, Melkhen, Melkhon, Melkhen. 
memorize this. And when I tell you to memorize something in this class, I really mean it. Spend the time, write out the note cards, write the charts, whatever, whatever it takes, repeat it over and over and over, over again until it really, really gets absorbed into your mind. Okay, that's the first set of endings. Now, these endings are also used with the following prepositions. This is very important to pay attention to. These prepositions, however, one, two, three, four, five, these six prepositions use this set of endings, not the second set. So this set of prepositions, beth, in or through, lemad, to or for, bathar, which means after, min, which is from, am, which is with, and luath is toward. If you want to say through me, you say b, beth, and then this ending. And here, the yod is always pronounced. So it shows how dumb that rule is. Sometimes it's pronounced, sometimes it's not. Melki, if you want to say through me, b. If you want to say through you, bach, bech, be, ben, and so on. If you want to say to me, you say li. If you want to say after me, after me, you say bathri. If you want to say after you, masculine plural, bathar chon. If you want to say from you, min chon. If you want to say from us, min nen. Just like surat, really. Am, if you want to say with you, you say amach. And so in mass, the priest says shlama am with chon, with you plural. And we reply, am, ach, with you, u am, and with, ruach, your spirit. You see that? You're already, you're already translating. And then luath, again at mass, in the Chaldean mass, and in the Assyrian mass, we say, luathach, luathach, alahe davraham, toward you, God of Abraham, and so on. And you can take luath and attach any of these endings, and it means toward you, toward me, you, and so on. Okay? So here's some examples. B is in me. Lchon, to you. Batharhen, after them. Feminine. Minnan, from us. Amach, with you. Luathach, toward you. Good? Okay. The second set of endings are when you want to say a plural noun, or when you use these prepositions. So this doesn't always mean plural, these endings, which we're going to go through in a second. They do not always mean plural. I really want to impress that in your minds. They don't always mean plural. They either are a plural noun. If they're on a noun, it means the noun is plural. Or it's just one of these prepositions that always uses the second set of endings. So let's go through the endings. If you want to say my kings, you say melke. So my king is melki. My kings is melke. Your kings, masculine, if you're speaking to a man, is melkeik. Your king's feminine is melkeiki. The yod is usually silent, so these sound the same, but they're spelled differently. Melkeik, melkeiki. So your king is Melkach. Your kings is Melkach. These are somewhat logical. What you're doing is you're taking the ending cup that's here and you're putting a yoth before it. Okay? Melkach, Melkach, Melkach. This is just a new thing to learn. His kings is Melkau. Melkau. And it's really spelled Melkauhi. Nobody ever says it Melkauhi, but that's the way it's spelled. Melkau means his kings. This is just a new ending to learn. Just learn it. And if you want to say her kings, it's Melke. Melke. Now, here's a problem. It sounds, her kings, Melke, sounds very close to his king, Melke. And I don't know what to tell you. That's just something to learn. You, that's just the way the language is. Melke, with that yod in the middle, that's not really pronounced, is her kings. Then we're back to a good pattern. Melkein, our kings. 
So Malkan, our king, Malkain, our kings. Malkaikon, or you'll sometimes see this spelled and pronounced Malkaikon. Don't worry about the softening. And in general, I'm actually going to tell you, don't worry about things when things are softened or not. For the passive kind of learning that you're going to do, it's actually not that important at all. Just learn the letters. Really, really. And maybe some nerds are going to be bothered by this, like some some like scholars. They they might think that the softening is important. It's really not to understand the language. It's important if you ever want to compose literature and you want to pronounce it according to some rules that nobody really cares about. But don't worry about the softenings. So melkeichon or melkeichon, it really is going to mean the same thing. There's never going to be a time when the the it's chon is going to mean something different than con. It's really, don't worry about that part of it. So Melke Khan, so Melk Khan, your king, your plural king. So here, let's talk about this. Your plural. So the people you're talking to are many. They have one king. Melk Khan. Here, the people you're talking to are many, and they have many kings. Melke Khan. Or Melke Khan. And then if there's a group of women you're talking to and they have many kings, Melkechen. Their kings, Melkehon, Melkehen. Again, Melkon, Melkehen becomes Melkehon, Melkehen. And that's the endings. Here's the endings by themselves. Memorize these two. Not much to memorize. The really sort of new things are these two. The rest, basically, it's the same ending that you already memorized because I told you to. It's the same ending with a yod before it. That's really all that's going on, except for these two. Now, I repeat, and you're going to be frustrated because you're, you're going to forget that I said this. These don't always mean plural. These endings are also used with this set of prepositions. It does not mean that these prepositions mean something plural. Al has nothing to do with plural. It just happens to use this set of endings. Sev toward, so th these are prepositions. Al, you don't say al li when you want to say upon me. You say alay upon me. There's nothing plural there. It just uses the set of endings. Sev, so maybe ignore the fact that I called these plural endings. This is just the second set, which happens to be used for plural nouns. So al means upon. You will never say alach. You will always say alaik upon you. Sayyid is toward. It's a sort of synonym to, to this, to Nwath. Maybe a slightly very different meaning, but but you never say sayyidi or sayyidach. You will always say sayyidi and sayyidik. Hlap. Some neo aramaic dialects will say hlap. It's a, the same word. Instead of hlap uses these endings. Lapain on behalf of us. Okay. Havar is around. It's always Havare, Havareik, Havareki, Havarao, Havare. Qdam, it's always going to be Qdame, Qdameik, Qdameki, Qdamao before him. Before meaning in front of, right? Belhod alone, Belhode, Belhodeik, Belhodeik, you alone. So you will never say You will never use this first set. So how do you know which one uses which? You just got to memorize it, dude. You got to memorize these prepositions. Always use these endings. And then these prepositions. Always use these endings. You just learn it because you're learning a language and you're a big boy and a big girl and it's okay to memorize things. However, the more you learn the grammar and the more practice reading you do, it's going to be very, very natural for you to say, well, alay, yeah, obviously it's alay because I've seen that word a thousand times in my reading. So you don't have to memorize everything today. You really don't. Get the sense of it, kind of repeat it a, a number of times, but you're going to see this in reading a lot. So let's see some examples. Alayk upon you, singular. Sayadain, toward us. Hlape, instead of her. Havareihon around them, Qdamao before him or in front of him. 
بل حوذين by ourselves okay I actually want to keep going now if you feel like you want to pause that's okay I'm okay with you pausing here the scholastic the scholastic personal pronouns repeated here are intuitive you know what no I take it back I think that's actually enough for this first lesson so next lesson we'll start with you know what sorry I made notes of what I, where I wanted to stop let me see if that's what I wanted to do yeah this is where I wanted to stop anyway so okay Good luck, learn these endings, and I will see you next class.